even, and you will encounter things up there that you might not want to encounter. For example, there is a creature called a mukade that you can find in Japan. The mukade is a centipede that is this long. And they're all over the mountains. I have a picture. You guys are I love you, Charles. I don't care. Just looking for the right one. Oh, the right one. I have a lot of photos of it. Okay, my, my entire computer is full of graveyards and all sorts of weird other stuff. Totally normal for you. Totally normal for me. I will talk about graveyards in a minute because that's one of the sections of this presentation. I just want to show you the scariest thing on, on 100 legs. <laughs> shrine pilgrimages, and they like to go look at temples. And I, I want to make a point, open reference point here. We talk about, oh man, Japan's got such a strong, sacred culture. There's all these temples and shrines all over the place, and they're really in tune with nature. And you guys driven down Route 13, there's a church like every half a mile. <laughs> there are just as many temples as there are churches. The thing is, we're looking at this from a different mindset, and we're used to seeing churches. Temples are a little different. Shrines are a little different. They are ritual centers, but the idea of the ritual center is a little bit altered from the Western idea. And when I go and talk about uh, one of the later slides, I'll show you one of the major differences between East and West, but there are a number of different types of shrines. You have your portable shrine. Wait, can someone drop the lights? This is really hard to see. There, better. So you have your portable shrines. This is a Mikoshi, and I'll go into Mikoshi a little bit later, but these are shrines that you carry around on your back throughout districts of the city to reinforce the connection between the community and the community's coming. This is a roadside shrine, literally on the side of the road. You can stop, leave your car there, get up, throw your coins, bow, get back in your car, and continue going. This is a backyard shrine. In particular, this is the backyard shrine to the Hashihime in Uji. The Hashihime is the spirit of divorce. <laughs> Notice nobody's taking care of that shrine. That's not going to be nice in the future. You also have mountain shrines. And in fact, there are a lot of beautiful temples built on the sides of mountains. The general idea is mountains are places of great power. There's a whole collection of folklore around these creatures called the Yamabito, the mountain people. People that lived there before the modern-day Japanese who were driven up into the mountains, and the mountains gave them incredible power. You have people called Yamabushi. 
mountain priests who go up into the mountains, study ascetism, and can break open rocks with their dick. There's, <laughs> there's all kinds of incredibly powerful mountain mythology, and when you visit a lot of these mountains, you get the sense that you're walking into something greater than yourself. This is Chuzonji Temple. And Chuzonji Temple is famous for being the place where the samurai Minamoto no Yoshitsune died. He was betrayed and murdered on this mountain. And there's a number of shrines around Japan that claim to be dedicated to Yoshitsune's memory. There's one in Yokohama, there's one in Kamakura. This one here is where he passed. There is a temple dedicated to him and his retainer, the warrior monk Benki, on the mountain. And Benki's grave is at the bottom of it. But when you go through these mountains, that's when they're on a rainy day. It takes some of a ghostly quality, you can see the mist, you can see the fog, and as you walk through it, you're walking through something that's been there for a thousand years or more. And then you have major shrines. This is Izumo Taisha. If there's something you talk to, Izumo Taisha is either the second or third most important shrine in Japan. Everyone agrees that the most important shrine in Japan is Ise. We build it every couple, of, every couple of decades. It's dedicated to Amaterasu, the sun goddess. It is about as important as it comes. Yes, it is incredibly important when you see those signs of a hundred sacred places to see before you die, that one's there. Now, based on who you talk to, talk to, the second most important is either Izumo Taisha, which is incredibly old. It's situated in Shimane Prefecture, which is one of the old kingdoms of Japan. And when the Yamato were trying to consolidate their power, the people of Izumo said, ah, 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 and they had to use political machinations in order to put it together. The mythology states that the god here, Kunimishi, almost went to war with Amaterasu. And she gave him the shrine, and they suddenly became best buds. Izumo Taisha is one of the most popular places to A, visit on New Year's. And if you go there on New Year's, good luck, you will never make it down, down the uh, rich, you will never make it down the commercial strip of the two million people. It's also very popular for weddings. They have a giant wedding chapel next door, a huge knot in front of it. And when I was there, they said, you need to pick it, you need to reserve this chapel like six months in advance just to use it. And I crashed like four wedding parties who wanted to guide you in the photo for some reason. <laughs> They're like, oh, oh, come here, come here, pose with us. But I don't know, you just pose with us. And then I hear them say, we gotta guide you. <laughs> Whatever. But when it comes to popular ones, you can't say anything without talking about Inari. Because Inari is the other big one. Inari is everywhere. And the thing I notice about, and you'll notice about Inari, is the more shrines you go to, every single shrine has at least an Inari box. At least an Inari box. And you'll find them in the most out of the way places. This is behind some dude's house. So this guy bought a house, and in his backyard was a shrine box, and he keeps it up. While you ride the trains, especially if you go outside of Tokyo, you will see from your window shrine boxes behind houses, side of the road with nothing around it, there's a box there. These are important sites. This is sacred space. And sacred space does not become non-sacred space. It stays that way. So you'll find these boxes behind houses. You'll find them as part of temple complexes. In fact, both of these Inari shrines are in the same town. Tono, which is the home of Japanese folklore. I'll get into that in a bit. This is at one of the shrines in Tono. I do not know what kami the shrine is dedicated to because I can't read Japanese that well. But I do know that this is Inari because of the red gates and the foxes. This is next to the Hachiman Shrine in Tono. And Hachiman is a warrior god who rides around on the back of a deer and shoots bows, and sometimes they've cosplayed by Hila Kitty, I'm not giving that up. And you have your box right there, and then you have your mountainside shrines. This is a shrine on Fushimi. Fushimi, uh, Inari Mountain is the big mountain, and based on who you talk to, it is again the second or third most important shrine in Japan. It is definitely the most visited shrine in Japan. For the last five years running, it has been the most popular shrine for foreigners because it's got a thousand red gates climbing up the mountain. The food there is amazing. And it's a beautiful, beautifully constructed shrine dedicated to separating you from your money. But when you go up the Fushimi Shrine, up, up the mountain, in Narayama, you find these private little shrines. And these private little shrines are operated by families that often will sell you a stone that you can put down on the mountain so you have a piece of a Nari Mountain just for you. So I arrived at this particular one. This was the second one I found. The first one was very small and in full sun, it was like 90 degrees that day, so I said, the hell with this. And I found the second one midway up the mountain. I walk in. And I'm struck by the quietness, I'm struck by the reverence, and I'm mostly struck by how many damn spiders there are. And the spiders aren't that big. So I walk in, and the shrine attendant is there, and it's just this, this middle-aged dude, and he, he just goes like this for a second. 
runs in the back and he shoves out his daughter. And his daughter speaks pretty decent English. And she asks him, do you want to take a sacred shower? Excuse me. Many pilgrims on the mountain like taking the sacred shower. Okay, well, where is the sacred shower? So she leads me back in the shrine. It's actually, it's over here. You have to go past all of this off to the back. And there's a little grotto and there's a waterfall coming up the mountain. It's a very small waterfall. And she just says, sacred shower, and hands me a towel. So I'm like, okay, whatever. I pull off my clothes and I stand in the water. The water hits me in the face and it's incredibly cold. And everything stops in that one minute. My ears pick up all these weird little sounds. My skin is tingling. Probably, well, of course, I'm cold water. I can smell the water, I can smell the earth. And for a split second, I realize I am standing in the domain of a, pardon my French, fucking god. And I just stop breathing. And I come out and I tell myself off, and I go back to the front, and she hands me a charm. I give her like 500 yen and I go on a trip. Later on in that trip, I discovered there's this practice called misogi. And misogi is when you stand under a waterfall and wash away your impurities. And a lot of Shinto shrines use misogi as a way of doing ritual purification. The rushing water washes all the impurity off your body and leaves you feeling refreshed. That is exactly what happened to me, and it's being described as a powerful religious experience because the rushing water, the temperature, the pressure makes you go out of your body and experience something else. It was around then that I started to understand the true essence of what Shinto is. And I found it on the side of the mountain. And I wasn't the only one. There were like four other guys going to get into that shower when I was done. I think I was in there for like two days long. This is what an area looks like at the bottom. When you come in with the massive red gates that they would open to the shrine, it's surrounded on all sides by food and merchandise. And while I was there, there's this uh, there's this TV series that came out two years ago called Inani Kon Kon Koya Roha, about a little girl who becomes a Shinto magical girl by, by sharing the soul of one of the kami associated with the Nari. There were posters for her everywhere in the show. You could even buy little anime uh, Ama with her face on it. And I'm like, do I want one? I should want one. I was trying to budget for my trip, and I came back with $1,000 more than I thought. Oh, and here's the last of my shrine I want to show you. This is an Inari shrine. It's small. It wasn't even open when I went to visit it, but it is in the neighbor, in a specific neighborhood in Tokyo. See, Inari is attributed to a lot of different things like family, hearth, harvest, rice, swords, money, food, credit cards, and sometimes Jesus. There's a lot of stuff that goes into Inari. We really don't know a lot about Inari. In fact, if you read books on Inari, one of my favorite books on Inari pretty much says, you go to an Inari shrine and ask three priests what Inari is, you get three completely different answers. So, this Inari shrine is in Akihabara. When you're going through Akihabara, you can leave the main drag, and right across the street from this, um, in that building, is the greatest katsu restaurant in the galaxy, according to my friend Gensai. And it is the best katsu I've ever had in my life. It's also the most expensive katsu I've ever had in my life. But right across the street is an Inari shrine, and there's a smaller one in Akihabara if you know where to look. So, these shrines are everywhere. They're seamlessly integrated into things. And when you get to a shrine, well, you usually see one of these cisterns. And these cisterns contain water being spat at you from the dragon god, or in this case, blessed by one of the bodhisattvas. And the goal is pretty simple. To approach the kami, you need to approach with clean hands and a clean mouth. You do not want to insult the kami with your ritual impurity. So you walk up to the kami, pick up the ladle. Left hand, right hand. Cup your hand, pour it in. Left hand. Ladle, put it down, and now you can approach the kami with unsullied mouth and unsullied hands. If there is this thing in Japan called the kaijin bubble, if you are not Japanese, they don't expect you to do that. There is only one shrine in Japan where if you don't purify, they will kick you out. It is Yasukuni, the shrine dedicated to the war dead. There are a lot of very strict rules about Yasukuni shrine that everyone is required to follow, but most shrines if you are Japanese, you are expected to do this. If you are a gaijin, you just run past, take pictures of everything, and leave. <laughs> and if you're a respectful gaijin, you do this. And I did this at every single shrine I went to. In fact, I found one on the side of the road by a mountain with no shrine near it whatsoever, and I did it anyway. Because <laughs> I don't want to anger the gods. That's the last thing I want to do. 
But when you go on to some of these shrines, there's a lot of beautiful things that you can find there. This is 108 Buddhas on a wall in Hasadera, which is a large Kano shrine in Kamakura. And you can leave a penny at the foot of each one if you have an hour to kill. <laughs> this is in Shuzonji. These are, the, these are the 12 lucky shrines dedicated to your zodiac sign. You find it, you put in 100 yen, you get a little fortune. I'm still carrying mine in my wallet. Those are three Buddhas that I found on Asadar, on uh, Chuzonji. I have no idea which Buddhas they are, because they're none of my Buddhas, but they're right there that you can grab a photo. Oh, and you can take a drink if you want. The sake is, you can drink that if you like. And this is a lucky bull. I found the lucky bulls at one shrine, the Kitano Shrine in Kyoto. And I'm wondering, what's up with all the bulls? The bulls, if you go up and rub the bull's head or rub the bull's ass, it brings you good fortune. And the Kitano Shrine is all about bringing yourself good fortune. The kami interred there at one point tried to destroy Kyoto. And after he was pacified and given the shrine, now he helps you, he helps you with uh, passing the high school exams, college exams, gives you success in business and administrative work, and people will go there and they'll rub the bull for good fortune. There are like six bulls in that shrine. I rubbed all six, then waited on like 45 minutes to ring a bell and clap my hands and bow to the kami, and the guy behind me is like, why did you wait? You could just walk up to the front, and I looked at him and I, I'm not that mad at you. I'll wait on that. Now, this is a Mikoshi. Mikoshi, so how many of you have ever heard the term Matsuri? You know what a Matsuri is, right? It's a party. The thing about Matsuri is, in many communities, the Matsuri is their stand-in for a regular religious service. Buddhist temples tend to have regular services. Shinto shrines tend to not. You just go to the shrine when you want, pray, and leave. For the monster, everyone in the community comes together for that one or two days. And the whole point is to reaffirm the connection between neighbors and to reaffirm the connection ultimately between kami and neighborhood. And many neighborhoods have multiple kami. This was the uh, monster in Otsuka, which is in Tokyo. It's in the north of Tokyo. It is one train stop away from Ikebukuro. So if you are in Ikebukuro and you just go on the Amanote line one stop, you will find Otsuka. And Otsuka is a typical Tokyo neighborhood. Some tall buildings, some shrines, some food, video game store, book off. It's like every other neighborhood there. And there are a number of Mikoshi attributed to it. So when you go to Mikoshi, it's a formally designed box with a giant stone slab inside. That stone slab weighs about half a ton. They make you put on ritual clothing. Usually, all right, here's the requirements. White shirt. You must wear a white shirt. Light colored shorts. And as you can see, I'm wearing the same shorts right now that I wore when I was in Japan. You must get a pair of tabi, because that's ritual footwear. They will provide you with tabi if you don't have it. But, like getting a public, you know how like they say you have the right to an attorney if you can't afford one, one will be appointed for you, and that attorney is not going to care about your case? The tabi they give you do not care about what you're walking on. So you go out there and buy tabi, nice, thick padding, because you're going to be carrying that shrine a lot. This is the neighborhood breakdowns of Karen Shrine. I have this blue one that goes all the way around the neighborhood. That was me. And you get a bunch of people together, usually about 18 to 25 people, and you are carrying that shrine that weighs half a ton for an entire day. You start at 11 in the morning, and you stop at about 6.30 at night. And carrying a Mikoshi is a very specific process. If you've never done it before, you will hurt yourself. But it's kind of like this. We're not walking. We're doing this. Or, if you want to be like really funny, you do this. But you're doing it in place. The shrine is moving itself. You're keeping time with the chanting and the clapping. And as you see, there's a guy in front pushing on it to keep it from moving too fast. It has to pass by every business, Every home, every inch of pavement has to have an Mikoshi go over it. And as you go over it, it reaffirms again the connection between the kami and the land. Now, when you get to the main grounds, this is in the middle of Otsuka, right by their little trolley system, there were 11 Mikoshi going around Otsuka that day. So we all gathered in the main area, there was food, there was a guy. 
there was a guy, I kid you not, selling old Japanese money. <laughs> From like the early pre-war Showa period money. And I'm looking at this old money and I'm like, I'm buying all of this. <laughs> it's mine now, I'm giving it to people. And then you pick up the Mikoshi, you carry it through the streets, and those streets are narrow. And you can see there's one Mikoshi here, one here, and one that way, going all the way down. You arrive at the central festival grounds. <coughs> you carry them up there, you bounce them up to the shrine, and then you can start putting them down. Mikoshi. Mikoshi cannot touch the ground at all. If you drop a Mikoshi, that's bad. So they, if you need to put it down, they have these wooden supports you can put it on so it doesn't touch the ground, but you are not carrying it. The thing about Mikoshi is, this is hard. It is painful. You are carrying half a ton around on your back for eight hours of a day. And if you start to flag, someone from the community will run up to you, tap you on the shoulder, pull you out, and jump in and take your place. So for the first hour or two, it's brutal, as your body is accustomed and you're acclimating itself to carrying the Mikoshi. And one of the things that you got to remember is, Shinto is about life. It's about experiencing life. It's about feeling life. And how do you remember life? Pain and pleasure. So sex and violence are totally fine. There is a Shinto, there is a festival called Hadaka Matsuri, called the Naked Man Festival, where you put 10,000 people on a platform the size of this room, standing like this for like six hours, and then at the end you chuck a pair of sticks onto the platform. The goal becomes to get the sticks and get off the platform. It's like a giant battle royale. And I will never do that. <laughs> but that's pain. But through pain, you realize you're still alive. So your back is killing you. You're, you're, you're chanting, and yeah, you're getting some energy from the crowd around you, but this is definitely a sacrifice to your day. After about an hour or two, you start to notice something. All the people around you start cheering, because they're really appreciating what you're doing. You're sacrificing time out of your day to carry this, this rock around the neighborhood, and they appreciate what you're doing for it. And then, about maybe three hours in, you start getting alcohol. <laughs> they give you everything. They give you shochu, they give you whiskey and soda. You will get horribly, horribly drunk while carrying the Mikoshi. But the thing about it is, you don't feel the pain anymore, and you're really, really happy. And you're developing a strong connection with the neighborhood. So as you carry it around, you take it to places of importance, and you often set it down, like in front of a local bank, at one point, we stopped in front of a tofu stand that had been there for 150 years, so we stopped there. And at one point, we stopped in front of an apartment complex for single mothers. And being a single mother in Japan is still a stigma. So this one is just mothers and their children. And I put it down, and I am at this point like five sheets to the wind. I've been drinking whiskey for like the previous hour. And this little kid, like this big, runs up to me hugs on my, on my uh, hobby and just hands me a single french fry. <laughs> and I look down at him and he looks up at me and he says in, in, in perfectly fine English, thank you for honoring our village. Then he does that anime thing where he looks at his feet and runs away. <laughs> and his mother is in the back by the fried chicken and she just does this to me. And I felt incredibly touched by this because I am just a guy, and okay, let me just tell you why I did this. My friend Tomoaki, I'm just gonna go back and show you one of the earlier slides. I, I normally tell, okay. Okay, here. This is my friend Tomoaki, who I was spend, staying with the whole time I was in Tokyo. He's a diplomat, he works for the uh, Foreign Service. Oh, and he got into the Foreign Service because of Mobile Suit Gundam. <laughs> I met him at Anime Next. So, he let me stay with him for the entire trip. And he told me, he's like, hey Charles, I'm going to be carrying a Mikoshi at a local festival. And I wanted to know if you'd like to come by the festival. I know you're only in Japan for 21 days, but can you, come, you want to come by and check it out? And I'm like, wait, you're carrying a shrine? Yeah, can I do it? <laughs> well, it's a big commitment. Can I do it? Well, why would you want to? Can I do it? Yeah, sure, no problem. I'll talk to them. And they talk to me like, yeah, sure, we totally need people, so you're going to do it. What I didn't tell him was the reason I wanted to do it was because of my friend Zach. He's done it, and I wanted to one-up him. <laughs> and granted, it's, it's a very selfish reason to do this, but while I'm doing it, I'm feeling more and more, more and more, <laughs> yeah, still there. 
I, I'm feeling more and more connected to the room. And then after the whole thing at the, uh, at the, the, the apartment complex, I go to this park and I meet the community leader. And he's the guy who organized this, all the Mikoshi and makes it work. And we're talking for a little bit. And he's like, why would you want to do this and whatnot? And I just said, you know, it was an experience. I never, it's something that no one else I know will ever do. And I just really wanted to get a connection. So then the weirdest part is all today, I don't know any of you people, but you've been treating me better than some of my friends. And he said, and he said to me, Kami-sama brings us together. And when Kami-sama brings us together, it changes both of us for the better. And I thought on that for a moment. I'm like, yeah, that is true. I don't know these people, but I feel connected to them. And now my name is on the temple rolls in Otsuka because I carried the shrine. And I have a welcome to go back whenever I want, and I'd love to do it again this year if I can find $1,000 to fly over there. But the idea behind it, let me just tell you about how the connections sort of manifest. While I was there, I lost my rail pass. It fell out of his pocket. And this was a $500 train pass that I could use to go all over Japan. My entire trip was taking me all over the Navy Islands, and now, oh my god, I don't have it. Damn it. The next day, I go back to Otsuka looking for it, and it's gone. It's completely gone. And I go to the Jilin Museum, and I'm all like feeling angry with myself. And I get back to my apartment, and they're like, they found your rail pass. Where? At that apartment complex, it was on the ground. So the people there looked at it, knew what it was, took it to him. He took it to the police and got back to me. And then I talked to the woman about it who found it, and she just said, thank you for all you've done. Enjoy Japan. <laughs> and that was it. That's the kind of connection you get to things like this. So you sacrifice for them, and it comes back to you. Kami-sama provides. And it allowed, even though I had to change part of my trip for this, I still got an invaluable experience that to this day, I cannot seem to shake because it's that kind of connection. So if you have the opportunity to do something like this, do it, it will change your life. Now, Tono is the home of Japanese folklore. It's up in the north and it's famous for kappa. So you, kappa, you know what I mean, seriously, they work them so hard they have to have a coffee break. <laughs> and when you go to Tono, kappa, these little goblets are everywhere. They tell you where the bus is, they tell you where the bike trail is, yeah, little Ami girl. Well, he's not so little. He's about yay big and he lives in my bedroom now. But you find a lucky red kappa from Tono and you can grab one and you can carry it with you. It's kind of a mark of pride for them. Hell, they even have a shrine dedicated to it. That's the kappa shrine. And I went up to Tono for two reasons. One was because of the Folklore Museum of Yanagita Kunio. Yanagita Kunio was an anthropologist like myself. and. Back in the day, when Japan was coming out of its isolation period, he created a form of study called Minzokugaku, Native Ethnology, or Salvage Ethnology, if you want to get more particular. And he said that Japan spends too much time this time trying to emulate other powers when we should be learning from ourselves here and now. Don't try to be Chinese, don't try to be British, don't try to be American, be Japanese, learn from yourself, don't ignore the folk culture, embrace it. And he wrote a book called uh, The Legends of Tono, still in print, it's been in print for over 100 years, you can still buy it. And he told a lot of these stories and learned a lot of folk customs, and it was a way to relate to old Japan. Not state Shinto, not imperial Shinto, but something older, the connection between mankind and the mysterious, and he said it gave a lot of credence to their own experiences. And he wrote down and recorded a lot of stories, so when you go to his museum, you see all these little statues dedicated to these tales, and you get a deeper sense of the mystery of things. The same time I was there, it was Tony Matsuri. This is their folklore festival. And I'm walking around Tono during the day encountering this. This is a shishi, well, don't worry, a shishi, a, a deer dance. There were 11 troops, one from every neighborhood in the Tono city in the municipality, that were there dancing in front of businesses and homes to bring in good luck for the new year. All these groups are made up of children. You have girls dressed up as the Zashi Iwarashi. You have teenage boys dressed up as the deer. You have young boys dressed up as Kappa, in a very stylized Kappa outfit. And they would go around the neighborhood collecting money, throwing rice at people, and dancing. And I observed and got a good video recording of this dance. Ask, the heck, you can hear it. 
So they do this all day, from sunup to sundown, dancing in front of every single neighborhood. They give the neighbor, they give the, 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 uh, the business a charm, they in turn receive money, and the cycle continues. Mutual prosperity. Kills on QA, we're all in this together, so we might as well work together for it. As you go through here, you encounter all these other interesting things, like for example, wow, I have a This is the uh, ritual ground, where as you go down it, you start to see all sorts of cool stuff like food. There's all kinds of food. You got your taiyaki, you got your yakitori. There's a dude over here selling video games for 500 yen a piece. Oh my god. Yeah, look at, look at all that stuff. There's guys with uh, colored ices. You can buy taco yaki, a koromiyaki. People are wearing, these are people that are carrying the koshi that were just having fun at the, at the uh, outset. And you go through the village spending money, having fun, and meeting people. While I was there, I proceeded to uh, buy a chocolate-covered banana. <laughs> and I got a lot of this thrown at me. This is Lucky Rice. It's just a rice cake that they hurl at you to give you good fortune in the new year. And over the course of the day, I had little kids throwing it at me. There was this one little girl that was like, yay big, that kept following me down the street, handing me more rice until her older sister said, he doesn't eat anymore. <laughs> but the kid was really excited and that's something, we talk about how kids aren't interested in their community and they aren't interested in their culture. And then you see these kids just getting really, really involved. At one point I met a bunch of little, little boys who were carrying around a tiny shrine that weighed nothing, but they were encouraging people to throw money into it. And um, at, the t uh, at the time I was with a guy who was, who was translating for me that I met at my Ryokan that night for dinner. And the kids were like, wow, where are you from, Gaichin Sama? New York. Whoa! Why did you come here to see you? Ah! And they were really excited about it because they didn't realize that outside of the garters of their little village, people still did things like this. But I thoroughly was having the time of my life meeting them and talking to them and enjoying it. And then I go back to, no, oh, that's a Mikoshi with two people on it. That's, that's, that's a lot, that's a lot. That's, that's like, it's like 1,400 pounds, 1,300 pounds right there. And they're just hurling it up like it was nothing. Now notice how they're actually walking. You sort of need to do it with that kind of shrine. That Mikoshi is twice the size of the one I was carrying. The village elders dressed up as the seven lucky gods, playing the drum and going downtown. And you can tell they've been doing it for a while because they look tired as hell. And as you go through it, I go back to my inn, I come out to, I come out to get changed batteries on my camera, I come outside into this, and a couple of groups are dancing, doing a banishment to banish evil spirits, and then after this is done, in the back there's two women carrying a carved wooden deer head. The deer is a sign of good fortune. So the deer can cross between the lands of the living and the dead, and fairy messages, banish things, and heal you. If you've ever seen Princess Mononoke, the great forest spirit is a Shishigami. And these are Shishigami. So they have this little wooden deer head, and they walks up to me, and they're like, they're like, the deer wants to bite you. Okay, so you bow, it bites your head, you bow, it bites your head again, you bow, it bites your head a third time, you give it some money, and it goes away. And this happens all day, throughout the entire village, to banish the spirits. And then I discovered, then this, there's this, this is the deer dance in the middle of town. I am standing across the street from the train station, every single group, that's what the Kappa outfits look like, by the way. They have one that for, for a little for, for kids as well. So, if you can see from the pan, it goes all the way back to the mountain. Dancing in a circle, and they do one complete circuit of the main drag back to the mountain, and then some of them go off to get dinner, and others continue dancing in the neighborhood. I found two or three crews after this when I was walking around visiting some of the other shrines. They're still doing this until sundown, until every group has visited every stop every business, every major residence, and then I thought it was over. And then I found out about the night festival. <laughs> so, this was shot on a GoPro, so it's not as good, but uh, that's when I went back to my inn, I was gonna process my video and start looking at things, and that's when I met Kazuhiko-san. He was in town for the festival as well, and the innkeeper said, hey, there's an American here who speaks terrible Japanese, why don't you talk to him? And Kazuhiko-san speaks really good English, so we hung out that night, he introduced me to some of his friends, and oh, by the way, it is legal to walk around holding open beer in Japan at night. Well, all the time. 
So I'm walking around with a Sapporo in each hand, going through this night festival. At the night festival, the dancing is really crazy because they're trying to cover the ground in deer hair. And if you can grab the deer hair, it gives you good fortune. I got two fistfuls of it, and my idiot attorney lost all of it when he took it back to the States. Yeah, well, he's an idiot. This is what it looks like at night. The stands are alive, the people are alive. Now that there's less people dancing, there's more people coming out and enjoying themselves. They're coming together and, and socializing and giving good fellowship within the village. The costumes are much different at night, and the shrines are much different at night. And you see from this, you see little kids on top of shrines screaming and hurling rice at you as they're walking down the street. Hell, they even turn the cop, the cop his eyes on. And um, then I'm standing there at the cross of the main intersection, and Kazuhiko san pokes me and he's like, Joss san, what does that look like to you? And I'm looking and I'm like, I don't know, Kazuhiko, what does that look like? <laughs> and in case you're wondering, no, that is, that is exactly what it is. It's a shrine, it's a male virility, or it's a, a divine tulto. And they're walking down the street, and they walk right up to the village elders. <laughs> Toss, 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 continue. And for them, it's normal. For an American like me with a dirty mind, I'm laughing really, really hard at this. And I really, really, really shouldn't. But it's really, really funny to me. Now, uh, I'm going to do I got to get my microsoft's notes back up on the screen so I can see. And. Okay, so I'm just going to take that. Uh, right, I have to see what my time is. Oh, 15 minutes. It's okay. So Nico. Nico is one of the places I went after I lost my rail pass. So I was originally going to go to the Mountain of the Dead, but since I lost the rail pass, I decided not to. And a bunch of people online on Facebook told me, you need to go to Nico. Were you on print? Were you one of the people who told me to go to Nico? Um, no. Okay, so it was someone else I know. There's a bunch of people. They were like, go to Nico, go to Nico, go to Nico. Why do I want to go to Nico? Well, that's is the grave site of Tokugawa Ieyasu. It is a quarter mile up a mountain that you have to walk. And when you go there, you will see everyone taking selfies with the great Shoda. But Nikko itself is a magnificent place full of these beautiful temples. These temples were built, they were there for a while, but they were eventually revamped in the, in the 1600s to honor the memory of Tokugawa Ieyasu. And this Toshoku complex has small temples, it has the see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil monkeys all over the place. There's a little sleeping cat statue that's been there for like 800 years that people like to take pictures of. And while I was there, I also found this. This is the Crying Dragon. The Crying Dragon is a temple that, according to legend, when Ieyasu died, the Dragon King shed his tears on this spot. So when you walk through the temple, you have these two things of wood, and you whack them together, it's like clunk, 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 clunk. Underneath the dragon's eyes, it sounds like breaking glass. Only under the dragon's eyes. So according to legend, that's where the dragon's tears are falling to the ground. Now the thing is, you are not allowed to take pictures. And if you're in Japan, Japanese cell phones make a sound, a clicking sound, when you try to take a photo. I'm an American. My phone doesn't do that. Flip my phone up, so I'm sort of going tap, 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 until I got one that you can sort of see. As you go through the mountain, though, you'll find in the Toshogu complex shrines dedicated to the lucky gods, where you can write your wish on a stone and just leave it there. There's archery for the lucky gods. There's all kinds of little temples spread out across this mountain. There's also a lot of cemeteries. Uh, Nico goes off in two directions. One direction is the, um, is the Toshogu path that goes up into the mountains, up to the top of the mountain, where Iemitsu, Ieyasu, and a bunch of sacred stuff happen. You go to the Kanma path, other side of Nikon, and you walk through the old town. The old town is like 50% abandoned. It hasn't changed since the 40s or 50s. It looks like old Japan. In fact, the tagline is, Niko is Nippon, because this is what Japan used to look like, and they pride themselves on not changing it. But the other side has an old shrine with 100 Buddhist deities around it that is in disrepair. Tons of these graveyards everywhere that you can walk through and just take photos of. And the further you get in, you get to abandon Nico. A part of Nico that no one really seems to live in. With creepy little, it's like walking into a Japanese horror movie. And there's a sign there that says, beware bears. 
And I went to visit this. This is the Kanban Abyss. The Kanban Abyss is rapids that cut through stone. And if you get too close and you're not careful, you will fall into it. I almost did right here. <laughs> Opposite the Kanban Abyss are the Bake Jizo. Jizo is a very important bodhisattva. Jizo is the bodhisattva of mercy and compassion. If you go to hell, Jizo is the one that pulls you out. If you're a child and you die young and you go to hell, Jizo is the one that pulls you out. Jizo is the one that you appeal to to, give, to release you from perdition. And in this row, there are 100, oh wait, if you're sitting here, you can hear the rushing of the water through the speakers. There are 108 of these Jizos. Sometimes all you have left is a head. Sometimes they're headless, as you can see over there. There are 108 of these Jizos going from one end of the river to the other. And as you walk down it, you are encouraged to leave coins. One for each sin. Remove all the sins, become pure. And many of them have money in their palms, and the people of the town consistently make the hats and the, I keep using the word bit, that's what it is, every single year to keep Jesus favored. And Jesus is literally everywhere. So while you may go to the touristy part of Nico, I highly recommend you go to the non touristy part of Nico. It's very creepy, especially if you go on it and it's overcast. I did. And it's cold, and it's wet, and it's different. Oh, but Nico isn't the scary, it's totally scary because like, you can get really good food there. This is a curry omelet rice that I got at a local restaurant. While I was ordering the curry omelet rice and eating it, it was completely delicious. It was like eight bucks. The guy there asked me where I was staying, and I said, Oh, I'm going back to Tokyo. He said, Oh, well, the train stopped running like 20 minutes ago. So now I'm stuck in haunted Japan overnight. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, it was the Tobu Nico line, which is what the locals ride. I was taking the JR Nico line, so that train stopped at 10.30, and I was able to get all the way back to Tokyo. Okay, here we go. Here's the good part. Here's the good part. So, uh, one of my friends is like, let's go to Akigahara. Okay, sure, let's go to Akigahara. And uh, Akigahara is a volcanic forest. About 10,000 years ago, Mount Fuji goes and erupts. That's, by the way, it's an abandoned playground. <laughs> Mount Fuji erupted and covered the ground in volcanic ash. And because of the volcanic ash, the forests around Mount Fuji are always green, no matter what the season. Aokigahara literally means sea of green leaves. And you can enter it through a number of different places. You can go through one of the lava caves, you can go through the bat cave, which is exactly what you think it is. And you walk down a nature trail, Park your car, you walk down nature trail, and you see these paths. And notice how the ground slopes up? It slopes up and drops on the other side. And once you go off path, all you're finding at that point is knotted tree roots that you can walk on. And these really dark trees, a really weird haze goes through the sky. Sometimes while you're down there, you'll find shadows or, well, that, that's a really creepy one. And notice how you can't see down the way. If you get lost in this forest, you get lost in this forest. This forest is only about, it's not that big, but if you get lost in it, you might never find your way out because everything looks the same. It's all treacherous. You'll find these caves. This is, this here, this is tree roots that have knotted together to form the overhang, separated from the ground. This cave goes back about six feet. You, I found a bottle of booze in there. <laughs> goes back about six feet. No, it's someone who drank it. And then you see these. These are all over the forest. And it says, um, at least the best of my translation, life is a precious gift when your parents don't throw it away. So for those of you who have never heard the name Aokigahara, it's also known colloquially as the suicide forest. So in the 19, in the terrible movie that was filmed in Russia. So in the 1950s, a novelist wrote a story, a Romeo and Juliet style story, where two young lovers who couldn't be together go to Aokigahara and <laughs> kill themselves. Aokigahara is cold, Aokigahara is quiet. You don't hear anything. There are no bugs, there are no animals. And the only thing I heard there that wasn't a human sound was the calling of a crow, and you know what crows eat. It's very dark and very cold. And pushes down on you, and if you go off the trail, you get lost. So if you go into this forest, you decide to end your life. 
No one will find your body. In fact, they go into the forest regularly trying to find bodies, and there is a law on the books that if you find a body, you are required to report it. Because they say that after dark, the spirits of the lonely and frightened dead come out and start screaming, and you hear those wails. Now, I wasn't there after dark because I'm not that stupid. <laughs> However, I did while I was there find this perfectly nice nature trail with a sign that says, don't enter. So I decide to enter. <laughs> and I'm walking down this nature trail. I mean, there's no cameras. They don't know what I'm doing. They're taking this on faith. I'm sorry. I'm an American. We don't, do, we don't listen to this crap. <laughs> so I walk down the trail. It was about maybe a quarter mile down the trail. My friend is freaking out because he's like, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. I'm like, what the the worst that could happen? <laughs> Never say those words. words. <laughs> Ratty futon in the middle of the forest with a bump in the I want no idea what's going on there. And those those no no entry signs, if you find them in the middle of the forest, that means someone died in the last six months. So they just blocked that path off so you do not go down it. Now, not too far from this futon, I found a crushed pack of cigarettes, an other empty liquor bottle, and some change on the ground, and a lighter. And yeah, I don't want don't want anything to do with this. So I turned around and I got the hell out of Dodge, only to find out I was lost. <laughs> and I was lost in that forest for a good two hours. So I followed my own standby, I picked a direction and walked in it. Because easily, when you get lost, just pick a direction and walk in it. I ended up coming out by one of the lava caves, and I was able to find my way back around. Those lava caves, by the way, are beautiful. This is ice. It is always just below freezing. So you have this beautiful ice, and many of them will also find silkworms. This is one of the hearts of silkworm cultivation. So I've got, oh, oh perfect. I have a little bit of time to show you the last. This is the last thing I do. One of the last things. Mizuki Shigeru Room. Someone paid me $25 to do a video on Mizuki Shigeru Room, and I'm currently putting that one together. And this is a place dedicated to the memory of this man here. Now, Mizuki is one of the greatest mangaka Japan has ever produced. He was one of the godfathers of Gekiga style. He did magnificent work in um, Retro to Noble Deaths, which talked about the futility of war. Showa, History of Japan, which is the greatest history of Japan I've ever seen. It's a, just a freaking manga. And most recently translated into English, Hitler, about Hitler. If you want to read it, sit in my room. The most awkward thing in the world is I'm like, I'm having a conversation with someone, I'm like, yeah, no, Hitler was awesome. <laughs> And someone walks by and he's like, excuse me? And I pull the manga out of my bag and we're like, talking about this. This manga is awesome. Hitler wasn't, but the manga was. I highly recommend you read it. I wrote a review of it for a German website and I didn't even know that it existed. And it's also dedicated to his greatest creation, Kitaro, who is him as a young yokai child. See, aside from his historical work, he did a lot of work with monsters. And when you go to Mizuki Shiro Road, you notice it's full of monster statues. The entire road has about 130 of his distinctive styled monsters that you can stop and take photos of, like the Kuro Kamakiri, who comes into your house at night and slices your hair off and eats it. Or the Ushioni, a spider or a spider bull that comes out of the water to scare you. And as you go down here, you see the legacy that he's left. And his legacy is powerful. He's done everything from great gods like Enma to scary women like the Hone Ona and the Ohaguro Batari. All these spirits. This one is most favorite, the red bean washer. He oh, washes yeah. his beans for good fortune. He's right there in the middle of the road. As you're walking down the road, seeing all of this. The bean washer. Wasn't he the guy who would get people to drown when they hear his washing? There's two bean washers. Ah, yeah. One of them washes them on the roof, and one of them washes them in the river. That's the river one. That is the one that drowns you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Just so, and then you have like Bento Bento San, the sound of Ghetto walking behind you. Don't turn around, it will eat you. <laughs> and these were the stars of his manga. While you're there, the music, they're playing the Kitaro television theme song. You can buy all sorts of Kitaro. I love them. There's, there's the guy from, uh, from Penn's Labyrinth. There's a lot you know, getting ready to set you on fire. Oh, they tell you where the bathroom is. <laughs> and while you're there, you can buy all this Mizuki Shiba Rufin stuff. Hanafuda decks. I sold a bunch of them last year at NecoCon. You can buy comics, you can buy shirts, you can buy shorts, you can buy shoes. And you can even go to the Yokai Warehouse, 
where you plop down 500 yen, you walk in, and it's the funniest thing you'll ever get because they try to jump scare you, but they're using all of Mizuki's monsters. On the way out, these two people were coming in and they were asking me, is it interesting? And I think, what were they saying? Oh, is it Tanoshi? I think they were just asking, is it cool? And I said, kitsch, and I never knew what that word meant. So I'm like, kitsch, kitsch, kitsch. They come out, and they're like, ah, kitsch. So apparently I added that to someone's lexicon. <laughs> So these are some of the things you can get. When you go into the yokai warehouse, you actually can you'll get this lucky charm. You get all three stamps. And they make it a game for kids, so adults, of course, are gonna have too much fun with it. You can buy these tankabons. This is sitting in my room, it's like this thick. Like those ghost story books I sell, I get my ideas from these to get those, to those ghost stories. And you got the museum. You can even buy sake that looks like his characters. That's a beckoning cat girl. And one of the things they have you do is you can buy this yokai passport, go up and down the main road collecting all of these stamps. And if you can collect all of the stamps of his yokai, they give you a prize. Particularly, they give you that. And it declares you to be an official yokai hunter. This is a game for kids. I am 30, I was 34 at the time, and I smoked those kids. <laughs> Mizuki's work was connecting the yokai and the real, and he made it fun and he made it a thing for people to see. So that's, I guess, the final takeaway I'm going to get you for this. Japanese folk culture is always present. It's always there. You see it in the shrines, you see it in the cemeteries, you see it in little games like this. The entire goal behind it is to find how it influences the lives of the Japanese. And that influence, you can then use it in turn to enrich your own life. So when you go over there, Go visit places. Don't just go to Akihabara and seriously don't buy anything there. Go to Nakano, it's cheaper. But when you go go to Nakano Broadway, it's Akihabara but cheaper. Buy like a lot. So it, you find all these little influences and all these little things, and you in turn will have a more rich, rich experience. So go there and enjoy it. Okay, that is my last panel of the weekend. If anyone would like to pick up one of my yokai books, I have them. I have two sets left of yokai inspired art. I have my Ghibli books, if you'd like to throw money at me, they're five dollars a piece and you will make me very happy. Other than that, um, I'll see you at the next I'll see you next year at AMA and uh, enjoy the remainder of the weekend. Woo